Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome back. Long time no see in person. Uh, we're really excited uh, to, yeah. So good to be back. Yes, you can clap. <laughs> We're really excited. Uh, we're really excited to be meeting in person again. If you're still meeting with us online, we're excited that you're uh, tuning in with us. Um, bear with us. We will be doing everything we can to avoid technical difficulties, but we can't make a huge promise. But we're so glad you're here. Just want to welcome you. I want to wish you a happy Father's Day um, as we come back. Um, so again, we're so excited to worship with you. Um, let's worship our Lord together. Let's stand together as we sing, lift up our voices. But he brought me his love for me, oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free. to see Jesus die for me. Yes, he died for me. Who the sun sets free, who is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Free indeed. I'm a child. 
morning. You may be seated, church family. Please pray with me. Dear Lord, we just thank you so much uh, for this day. We thank you for uh, the chance to get together and worship, Lord. Um, I pray that you would um, move, <laughs> move in a special way in this place, God, as we, as we come together as the church, God. Um, in times where we could have felt like we were isolated or separated, we know we were never isolated or separated from you, but we know that um, the community in the church felt lacking when we couldn't see each other on these mornings, God. We thank you for the chance to get back together in that way. Um, I pray that you would continue um, to grow us, to teach us um, in how to follow you well. I pray that uh, the church would be um, a light in these times when there are, uh, there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of disunity. God, I pray that the church and the gospel would be uh, something that brings people together um, under our Savior and under our Lord, God. Uh, we thank you for who you are. Uh, we thank you for calling us together as the church, letting us do this life uh, in community and help us to live on this mission together. Uh, we thank you again for calling us in. We pray that your protection over us um, and for you to again move in a special way that we would connect to you more today um, than we had been. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and worship. Don't you love to see these kids worshiping up on the front row? Let's sing it. But it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures of fame I never enough. Then you came along. Now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you.
sing it one more time together. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. Do you believe that, church family? Worshiping the Almighty God. He is the great I am.
Amen. Thanks, Emmanuel. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Lewis. I'm lead teaching pastor here at City Awakening. Uh, great to gather with you both on site and online. For those of you watching us at home, uh, happy Father's Day to everybody. Uh, for those of you who are watching this online, uh, we want to encourage you to find a local church in your area. If we are that local church, then and, and you want to know maybe more information about City Awakening or how you can even join our church, be a part of City Awakening in this community, uh, we would invite you to, to uh, let your host know in the chat box, or you can email us at info at cityawakening.org, and we'd love to be able to connect with you. Uh, for those of you who are here with us uh, on site right here, right now, you know, I know it's a little bit awkward, you know, which is all the social distancing stuff in place, wearing the mask. I accidentally put a mint in my mouth when I had my mask on earlier, and I started to cry. They weren't, <laughs> it was legit tears, but it was from a mint, okay? So this is going to take a little bit of getting used to, but you know what? I, I don't want anybody to be discouraged regarding having to meet like this or anything. In fact, this is an encouragement to me personally, because I've been thinking about this, how the church has survived throughout these transitions. I mean, this is a hard transition to make. To go from meeting on site like this to transitioning everything online, that's hard. And we've survived that. So be encouraged by that. All right. And don't let this be a time of complacency as we transition into meeting together like this. Instead, let it be a time that, that causes us to want to continue to live on mission, to continue to share the great news of Jesus Christ. And so we want to encourage you to continue to uh, do your RSVP online but then also copy the link to the RSVP on our website and share it with a friend. You know, invite your friends to RSVP as well. Listen, let, let us, even though the meetings are looking a bit different, the gospel message and the gospel mission of Jesus Christ isn't different. All right, it continues. It's the same mission. It's the, the, the same motivation is Jesus Christ for us to want to live like this. And the same mission is to reach people and reach the world with the gospel. And we can do that both on site and even online. So let's continue to do that. Let's continue to grow the church and advance the gospel in our city, both locally and globally. All right. That being said, today we are continuing our teaching series that we've been doing called Visible God. All right. And it's all about seeing God through the life of Jesus. So we've been studying a book of the Bible called The Gospel of John. And it records the life and the words of Jesus as it was written by an original source, an original follower of Jesus. Now, what we're going to talk about in particular today is our treasures. All right, it's our treasures. And so let me, let me ask you this question. What is it that you treasure in life? You know, what are some of the things that you treasure in life? You, know, you treasure money? Is it some, some of us, right, you treasure money. Do you treasure your material possessions? Maybe a certain material possession that you own. Do you treasure your health? Do you, treasure, do you treasure your family, your friends? Maybe time, you treasure time, time with your family and with your friends. What is it that you treasure most in life? See, everybody treasures something. And here's the thing that I know about the things that we treasure, is that we will make sacrifices for that which we treasure in life. 
Everybody treasures something and will make sacrifices for the things that we treasure in life. So for example, if you actually tre treasure money, if, if money is something that you treasure, then you will be willing to sacrifice your health and even time with your friends and family in order to be able to obtain more money. You will work more hours, endless hours, you know, at the expense of your own health, the stress levels that it'll put on you, at the expense, expense of spending time with your friends and your family members. You will do all that. You'll make sacrifices to be, up, be able to obtain more of that treasure of money. Now, on the flip side of things, some of us, we don't treasure money. You know, some of us don't treasure money, you know, and instead what we treasure is our health or we treasure, you know, time with friends and family members. And so we'll be willing to take less pay. We will sacrifice pay, sacrifice more money for the sake of, of spending more time with our friends and family. In fact, industrial, you know, or the corporate America uh, has learned a lot about this over the past several years when it comes to the millennial generation. Millennial generation, a lot of them, not every millennial does this, but most millennials, they will be willing to sacrifice bigger pay, bigger salaries if it means having more time off, more time with friends and family. They will take a job that pays less money to be able to have more time with their friends and family. Again, not every millennial does that, but corporate America has realized that over the past several years, so they offer more incentives for people when it comes to jobs. My point is this. Everybody has certain things that they treasure in life, and we are willing to make sacrifices for that which we treasure. So the question isn't, are you making sacrifices for the things that you treasure? Instead, the question is, are the things that we treasure worth the sacrifice? And that's a question that we need to examine in our own hearts. It's, are the things that we treasure right now, that we're treasuring in our life right now, are they worth the sacrifices we are making? And this is what we're going to talk about today. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn them over to John chapter 12. We'll be in John chapter 12, verses 1 to 8. We'll also have the words on the screen for you. Uh, if, you if you open your Bibles in the middle, keep turning a couple books to the right, you'll find John there. All right, John chapter 12, verses 1 to 8. Title of today's message is Our Greatest Treasure. All right, our greatest treasure. And here's the big idea. Jesus is, is our greatest treasure. Jesus is worth more than our greatest treasure. All right, that's the big idea. Jesus is worth more than our greatest treasure, and that's what you're going to see in the text today. All right, so let me give you a little bit of context here. In John chapter 11, verses 1 to 44, Jesus claims to be the resurrection and the life, and then he proves it when he raises Lazarus from the dead. He proves that he really is the resurrection and the life. He really is the God who can grant us eternal life. And then in verses 45 to 57, it says, many people come to faith in Jesus after witnessing this event. But there's a group of religious leaders called the Pharisees who keep trolling Jesus. All right? They don't like Jesus. They, they don't like the fact that all these people are starting to follow Jesus. And they're concerned that more people are going to start following Jesus after this miracle. And they're concerned that the Romans are going to come in because anytime Jesus does a miracle, you have people believing in him. And you have some people who are disgruntled about him, like these Pharisees in the text. And so they're worried that the Romans are going to come in and they're going to wipe them out as a nation, pull away some of their freedoms and things like that. And so what, are the, the, what the chief priests and the Pharisees do is, is they issued Jesus's death warrant in chapter 11. All right, chapter 11, they issued Jesus's death warrant, and this becomes a major transitional point in the gospel of John. The gospel of John is 21 chapters long, and chapter 11 and chapter 12 is the transition point where Jesus is now starting to make his way towards the cross. All right, this is a major transition point in the, in the text. He saves Lazarus's life, but he's also preparing to lay down his own life. All right, that's your context. And we're going to pick it up in chapter 12, verse 1. John chapter 12, verses 1 to 8 states this. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was. All right, so notice that Jesus is coming back to Bethany. All right. At first, he actually leaves in chapter 11. He, he leaves Bethany once the, the death warrant is issued. He leaves Bethany. But now we're seeing in verse 1, chapter 12, he's coming back to Bethany to celebrate the Passover. And so tensions are starting to build more and more towards Jesus heading to the cross. In fact, in chapter 11, verse 57, it says that the Pharisees started to spread word telling everybody, if you see Jesus at the Passover, then you need to let us know immediately because we're going to arrest him. So the tensions are starting to build more and more towards Jesus going to the cross. And here's what I love so much about verse 1. It's that Jesus is willing to go. He is willing and ready to go to the cross for us. He's willing and ready to go to the cross for me. He's willing and ready to go to the cross for you. Because verse 1 tells us that he left Beth Bethany, but now he's come back to Bethany. He's coming back to the very place where his life was just put in danger. Jesus isn't cowering from the cross. He's walking towards the cross. 
He isn't running away from the cross. He's going to the cross. He's back in Bethany to the very place where his life was being threatened. Jesus is back in Bethany. Again, verse 1, six days before the Passover. Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they give a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. All right, so this isn't just kind of some normal, you know, uh, you know dinner where you're just kind of hanging with your friends, you know, kind of chillaxing, whatever you want to call it, you know, just lounging around, doing your own thing, you know, and then you know, everybody's hanging out, and then somebody gets hungry or hangry. Some of us get hangry. I'm, I'm that kind of person, you know. And then all of a sudden, you're like, oh, you know, I'm just going to order some Domino's or I'm going to Uber, you know, uh, something to eat because I'm just too tired to cook, all right? And come on, anybody in there like that? I mean, I get tired, so let's just order some dominoes or pick up some hot and ready's, all right? This isn't, this isn't one of those moments. All right? This is a, a moment where like, there's a lot of preparation going into this meal. So I want you to picture that. This is not just a quick, quick meal. This is a lot of preparation going in. Perhaps this is why uh, Martha is mentioned in the text. Martha is Lazarus's um, sister. And what we know biblically about Martha and historically about Martha is she was the type of person who wanted um, you know, everything to be prepared, very meticulous. She wanted every guest to feel just welcomed and at home and celebrate it and you know, everything. It was her way of honoring uh, the people in her home, honoring the guests in her home. In this text, it's her way of honoring Jesus, using her gift of hospitality. She's the person who, you know, wants everything to per- be perfect. If you're staying the night and, you know, at her house, she's going to have the towel on the bed, you know, shaped into a swan or a monkey or something like that. You know, she's going to have a little, you know, the sh- hotel shampoo pool bottles with a loofah or something, right? That's Martha. And so perhaps the reason why she is being mentioned in the text here is because of her meticulous nature and to show us that this is a major celebration dinner here. What are they celebrating? They're celebrating Jesus. Notice what the text says. This is a dinner for him. Right? This is a dinner for Jesus in celebration of Jesus, in honor of Jesus and what he just did in resurrecting Lazarus from the dead. Their response to Jesus' grace upon them in this moment is to celebrate and honor Jesus. That's what they're doing here, and Jesus is about to be celebrated and honored in a very special way in verse 3. Verse 3 states, Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with hair, with her with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Now, so we're gonna spend a little bit of time on this because I want us to be able to understand what's happening here contextually. And if we don't do this, if we don't look at it from the perspective of what's happening here contextually back then in history, then we're gonna kind of just miss some of the details, I think, of this. See, back then what they would do is, is they, and it was nothing like abnormal in the sense of her, like you want to you know, put perfume or ointment or something on a guest in home, because what they would do is, is whenever you had a banquet or something like this, they would uh, put ointment or you know, perfume on you to kind of cover up some of the smell. And here, here's why, and this, this is why, all right? It's because back then they didn't have things like we have today, deodorant, um, access to running water where they could take showers daily. And so, you know, think about in hot climates like Florida, you walking around, us walking around, not having that luxury. I mean, a lot of us are going to, we're going to smell, we're going to stink, right? You know, it's kind of like being in a line at Disney. You know, everybody stinks. It's like, you want some social distancing, please. Like, you know, something like that, right? Everybody just kind of in that moment. This is what's happening back then. In the hot climate, people would sweat and they would smell. And so then they would come in to the house and a way to honor your guests and the people there was to be able to give them some ointment or some perfume. And it's not making fun of anybody in doing that. It was a part of what they would do. And so, you know, this is a moment where she is doing, Mary is doing what is custom. She's doing what's normal. But there's three incredible things that she does that are not normal. Three incredible things, three incredible ways that she is showing honor to Jesus, displaying honor to Jesus, displaying that she treasures Jesus above all else. And I want you to see what those three things are. Number one, she breaks the jar. Right, she breaks the jar of ointment. She breaks the jar of perfume. Now, you don't see this in the, in the Gospel of John. You see this detail being given to us in the Gospel of Mark. There's multiple accounts on this, Matthew, Mark, and, and John. And Mark gives us the detail of her actually breaking the jar in Mark 14, verse 3. And then he even tells us what kind of jar this is. He tells us that it's an alabaster jar that's holding the ointment and the perfume. Alabaster jar was considered to be very expensive stone. It was, it was a beautiful, strong stone like marble. 
And so it was very costly back then. And so because it was such a beautiful, strong stone, what they would do is, is they would hold expensive ointments and, and, and perfumes in something like that. And in fact, it was so expensive and the, the contents that would be preserved in it were so expensive that families would actually leave this as an inheritance for their children. It was a way to give them financial security if something in the future happened to their kids. Maybe it was, you know, a famine or, you know, some disaster happened or, you know, just financially the family started to get into some, some hardship and some trouble. Well, they would pass this down throughout the generations to be able to, to give their family and their kids some financial security. And so when, when Mary brings this alabaster jar out with the perfume in it, you know, the, the, the guests that are sitting there, they're all like, ah, yes, this is the perfect way to honor Jesus. But they're thinking a little dab here, a little dab there, you know, maybe spritz here, whatever. You know, that's what they're thinking. And she breaks the jar. She breaks and uses the entire thing on Jesus. The text even says that the entire room is filled with the fragrance. She breaks the jar and uses the entire thing on Jesus. That's number one. Number two, she puts perfume on his feet. All right, this is the second incredible thing that, that Mary does here. First, she breaks the jar. Second, she puts the perfume on Jesus' feet. Now, back then, the foot, you know, people's feet, you know, maybe some of y'all would agree with this even today, but back then, a person's feet was considered to be the dirtiest part of a person's body. Again, we have to remember that there was no, like, you know, uh, running water, so they couldn't take showers daily. They would walk around with open-toed sandals in the dusty desert, and, and so the feet were considered dirty. In fact, the feet were considered so dirty that in some regions, they actually had a law forbidding even slaves from being able to wash a person's feet. They considered it so disgusting and so demeaning that they would not even allow slaves to be able to wash a person's feet. Yet what we're going to see happen in chapter 13 is, and I'm going to preach on this in a couple weeks, we're going to see Jesus bending down to wash his disciples' feet. I mean, think about that. Jesus is so amazing. He's, he's so holy. He's so righteous. Yet he's willing to stoop down to wash somebody's feet, to take even the most lowliest of jobs. In fact, his disciples start to rebuke him in this moment and tell him, no, no, Jesus, you're too good for this, man. You're a rabbi. You're, you're Jesus. No, you shouldn't be doing something like this. And I'll give you his response in a couple of weeks. You know, I know some, um, some churches and some pastors who actually won't let a person get on staff at their church unless they're willing to clean the toilets in the church. Now, this is kind of equivalent to what's happening here. Now, they want to make sure that they're willing to do what some might consider to be the lowliest of jobs in a church before they let them on staff. Now, nothing against janitors or anything like that. Andrew will tell you I worked three jobs before we got married trying to raise money for our family, and one of those jobs was I cleaned toilets. Jesus is willing. He's such a great, humble servant leader that he's willing to even, though, take on the lowliest of tasks and what we see Mary doing right here in washing, washing Jesus' feet is she is serving like Jesus. She's expressing and displaying humility towards Jesus. Number three, she wipes his feet with her hair. She wipes Jesus' feet with her hair. Now, I'm married to a hairstylist, okay? A woman who cuts hair, on, you know, she's gifted, she loves it. You know, my wife's great at that. And there's something I know about ladies is that they love their hair. I, mean, I had multiple people contact me, you know, during all the, you know, social Disney. You know, hey, can, you know, can Andrea do my hair? Can she fit me in and stuff? And I'm like, she'd love to, but, you know, she can't lose her license, you know. Being married to a hairstylist is a really hard thing, too, you know, because she can always get her hair done. And so there's days she'd get mad at me early in our marriage when I didn't notice her hair getting done. So now she comes home, I'm like, hey, your, your, your hair looks good, honey. I didn't get it done. I'm like, I can't win, you know. Can't just compliment your hair today. It looks good. Ladies care about their hair. Could you imagine taking your hair down and cleaning somebody's feet with your hair? Could you imagine, especially somebody who's been walking around, maybe in the dirty desert, open-toed sandals, you taking your hair down to wipe a person's feet? Listen, it, it, there's, there's nothing that's really normal about this moment. Not these things right here. In fact, in the Jewish culture, 
uh, it would have been often considered disgraceful for a woman to take down her hair in, in public. You know, we see a lot of uh, Islamic uh, places uh, doing that. It wasn't just an Islamic thing. This was also a, a um, Jewish thing as well. You take down her hair, it was considered to be a disgrace. And so what is she doing here? What is Mary doing? What is she doing in this moment with these three things? You know what she's doing? She's saying, Jesus, I don't care what everybody else thinks of me. I don't care. I treasure you so much. I, I, I want to honor you so much. You are so worthy of sacrifice. You are worthy of me sacrificing and submitting to you everything that I have and everything that I am. Jesus, you are so worthy of sacrifice. You're worth me sacrificing my wealth, breaking this alabaster jar. You are worth me sacrificing my pride by bending down and washing your feet. You are worth me sacrificing even my own reputation by taking down my hair and wiping your feet with my hair. Jesus, you are worthy of all of that sacrifice, and so much more. That's what she is saying in this moment. She treasures Jesus so much that she is willing to surrender everything she has to Jesus. City Awakening, are we willing to do the same? Do we treasure Jesus like Mary is treasuring Jesus here in the text? Do you treasure Jesus with your wealth? Is he worthy of your wealth? Is he worthy of you sacrificing your pride? Is he worthy of you sacrificing your reputation for the sake of sharing his name with our city? Sharing his name globally, even being willing to go to him and say, Jesus, here I am. I, you know, all that I have, I'm, I'm willing to serve you in this city and I'm willing to serve you overseas globally on global missions if need be. I'm willing to lay my entire life down for you because you're worthy of all that. Mary is saying, Jesus, I treasure you so much that I don't care what anybody else thinks. I am, I am willing to surrender everything to you. But this is too much for the people sitting around the table. You know, the wiping the people's feet up with her hair became became too much for them. That was where the line kind of got drawn and the people start getting all riled up. Verse 4, but Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he, he who was about to betray Jesus said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Judas is angry in this moment. Judas is angry, but he's not the only one that's angry. Because we get, again, more detail. Matthew and Mark's gospel gives us a little bit more detail and tells us that even the other disciples that are sitting around there are angry too. It says that they were, uh, you know, intolerant towards her. You know, they, they were, um, uh, you know, basically scolding her, the text says, for doing what she did. And I think we need to be very careful whenever we read texts like this and think to ourselves, yeah, man, idiots, like, you know, can't believe they would do something like that. Because a lot of us read this story with the mentality of already knowing what's, what's already happened. We've got to be careful not to do that because I think if we were in their shoes too, we'd probably be responding the same way. I mean, think about what's happening in this text. Right? She's spilling this expensive perfume all over Jesus and wiping it up. That's not normal for us today, and that is not a normal custom to do back then. What was normal was, yeah, a little dab here, avoidment and stuff, but not what she's doing to this extent. And so I think even if we saw somebody doing this today, we would probably respond in a similar way. But I also want you to notice how much Judas says this, this perfume was worth. He says it was worth 300 denarii, which is equivalent to roughly 300 days worth of wages. Right, so roughly a, year, a year's worth of, of a person's salary. So if we're using today's, you know, standard average American household, some of you may make less, some of you may make more, average American household makes about $60,000 a year. So this would be equivalent to, to somebody, you know, basically pouring out $60,000 of perfume on somebody. How do you think you would respond? You know, see, seeing that happen. I did a little Google search this past week just to find out what the most expensive perfume in the world is. It's called Clive Christian No. 1 Imperial Majesty. Ooh, right? Here's their slogan. Its scent is light, light to heat in vanilla with a hint of rosa centophilia that is reminiscent of the goddess of love and beauty, Aphrodite. I didn't know we captured Aphrodite's scent. <laughs> but apparently Aphrodite's scent is worth $215,000 a bottle. $215,000 a bottle. 
There's another one that was like one, uh, another competitor or whatever in the world that recently came out. It's called uh, Shamuk, Shamuk, and uh, it's worth $1.3 million for like roughly, I think it's a liter or three liters. Can you believe that? So picture that in this moment. Picture you seeing somebody buying this $215,000 bottle for whatever, you know, bring it, and then just spilling it all over. I think I would respond the same way that Judas and the disciples are responding. I think I'd be, man, what are you doing, Mary? Like, it's so wasteful. Why would you waste that? Why would you do, you, you could have used that money for something else, for some greater good. Judas says you could have used it for the poor. I think it's a fair comment, a fair question. But Jesus doesn't really care about the poor. What he cares about is himself, which the text says next, verse 6. He said, he said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. All right, so in other words, you know, he's a guy who just, you know, he wanted to, he wanted to be able to have more riches, more wealth for himself, you know. So, you know, he's, he's upset because he didn't get a cut of the, of the, the perfume, that's what he, I, you know, I could have had some money from this. I could have dipped into the, you know, the bag and, you know, taken some for it. It's for himself, the text states. Uh, John Piper says this. He says, in response to the worth of Jesus, Mary's heart was full of wonder and thankfulness and joy overflowing in lavish demonstrations of affection. But Judas's heart felt none of that. He valued money more than he valued Jesus. Mary loved and treasured Jesus. But Lazarus loved and treasured money. He didn't care about the poor. He cares about himself. Verse 7, Jesus said, Leave her alone so that she may, may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. And so listen, that, that, you know, th this is one of those moments where some people have tried to say, oh, well, Jesus doesn't care. Now, if you go look at historically everything that Jesus taught, he often taught about the poor. He often expressed a lot of concern for the poor. So the implication here has nothing to do with Jesus having a lack of concern for the poor. Instead, the implication here is a sense of urgency. That's what Jesus is, is implying here. That's what he's talking about here. He's saying that there's a sense of urgency here that Mary understands that she is grabbing. We don't know how she completely understands this, but she senses the urgency that Jesus is about to die. He's about to go to the cross. So Jesus, in a sense, is kind of like triaging here the moment, right? He's, you know, if, if somebody were to say to you, okay, well, you know what? You, you have a choice. You, you can either go to work today uh, or you can say goodbye to a family member that you love that's going to die, right? You, you triage that. And most likely, you're going to go and you're going to say, you know, I'm, I'm not going into work today. I'm going to treat, I mean, if, if this is the last moment that I'm going to get to say goodbye to this person that I love, I'm going to say goodbye. So in a sense, that's what's happening here in the text. Jesus is saying is, is, Mary is triaging correctly. She knows that I'm about to die. I'm about to go to the cross. The poor you're going to always have. You can care for them later. You know, uh, D.A. Carson says this. The point is, under normal circumstances, concern for the poor has its place. But these aren't normal circumstances. The Messiah is about to die, and Mary, in a gesture rich with prophetic symbolism, has met the need of the moment by anointing Jesus for burial. She realizes somehow, some way, again, we don't believe she understands it all, everything that's about to happen, the extent of it. But somehow, some way, she gets a sense that this is the last time that I'm going to see Jesus. And so, so she is honoring Jesus with everything that she has. Jesus says, leave her alone because he's affirming her sense of urgency and her decision that she made. He says, you know, the poor you will always have because he's saying, listen, I'm going to be here for a little while. I'm going to die. And, and I want you to continue to care for the poor when I'm, after, when, when I'm gone. Now, this entire story in a sense, is meant to be read with the perspective of a contrast between, you know, how much Mary treasured Jesus versus how much Judas treasured Jesus. See, Mary treasured Jesus, but Judas treasured money. Mary treasured Jesus to the point to where she was willing to sacrifice an entire year's worth of salary for him. But Judas eventually treasures Jesus so little that He's going to trade Jesus in for a few thousand dollars. 
This is, this is a difference between worth. All right, it's a question of worth. It's what is Jesus worth to them? And it's clear that, that Jesus was worth everything to Mary. She treasured him so much, and he was worth so much that she was willing to sacrifice everything, surrender everything to Jesus. But, but Jesus was worth so little to Judas that he wasn't willing to, to any sacrifice. Instead, he was willing to trade Jesus in for other treasures. City Awakening, what is Jesus worth to you? What's he worth to you? What have you been trading Jesus in for? What have you been trading Jesus in for recently? Have you been trading in spending time with Jesus for lesser treasures? You know, maybe when all this COVID stuff wasn't happening, you know, trading time with Jesus in for your travel ball, your kids' sports, extracurricular activities, maybe, you know, trading Jesus in for lesser things, scrolling, you know, your social media, scrolling, TikTok, binge watching, you know, certain things all the time. Not that any of those things are even bad things. I'm saying, are you trading time with Jesus in for lesser things? Have you been trading in your wealth for lesser things. In particular, trading in, giving financially to Jesus' local church. I don't care if it's this local church. I'm talking any local church. Supporting the mission and the mission of Jesus Christ to spread the good news of the gospel because Jesus works in and through his church. We are supposed to support his church. But are you treasuring Jesus by giving financially to church, some of you maybe even giving more generously than you know you are able to. We're trading it in for lesser things. Are you trading even in your ethical or moral walk with Jesus for lesser treasures? Do you treasure Jesus like Mary to the point to where you are willing to surrender all to him? Or do you treasure him so little that you're willing to trade him in for other things? City Awakening, the big idea is that Jesus is worth more than our greatest treasures. He's worth so much more than our greatest treasures. And the reason for us to be wanting to submit our entire lives to Jesus is because of the great love that he displayed for us on the cross. He treasures me so much. He treasures you so much. He treasures us so much that he was willing to sacrifice his entire life for us on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. We should want to submit our lives to him because on the cross he submitted his entire life for us. He sacrificed his entire life for us. He didn't submit to us. He surrendered his life for us. I'm just going to admit something to you here because I think too many times pastors will preach at you instead of standing with you in the midst of all of this. And I'll tell you where my heart was most convicted this past week when I was studying this. I always want to preach to myself before I come to preach to anybody else. And, and where my heart was, was most convicted this week is that, I'll admit this, okay, that my my um, level of surrender does not match the level that Jesus is worthy to be treasured. It doesn't. My level of surrender does not match the level that Jesus is worthy to be treasured. My level of surrender doesn't match the level of surrender that Mary has in the text. And as I thought about that this past week, trying to view that from a gospel-centered perspective, not to guilt myself or anybody, not to beat us down, but to say, man, you know, how can I look at this from a gospel perspective? And when I'm looking at this from a gospel perspective, I'm saying to myself, wait a minute, but what does that say about how amazing Jesus must really be? I mean, think about that for a second, right? I mean, Jesus is so much more amazing than our current view is of him. He is. I mean, he's so much more amazing than our current view of him. Here's why I say that, because right now, I think Jesus is amazing as he is right now with a tight fist. I think Jesus is amazing right now with a tight fist, meaning I have a tight fist on tre certain treasures other than him. There's certain things in my life I've let go of right away, but there's certain things that I tend to cling back to. 
And if I think Jesus is that amazing now with a tight fist, imagine how much more amazing he actually is because Mary sees how amazing he is and she's willing to open up her hands completely to Jesus, releasing all her treasures over to him. I mean, think about that, right? She sees Jesus, she sees his love, she sees his glory, she sees his power at a level that is so magnificent that it causes her to completely open her hands up, loosen up her grip on all her treasures, open her hands completely to Jesus, saying, I surrender all to you. It's incredible. She sees him at a level that is so magnificent that she says, Jesus, I surrender it all to you. I surrender everything that I have to you because you are worthy. You're worthy of all that sacrifice. You are worthy of worship. You're worthy of praise. You're worthy of glory. You are worthy of me surrendering all that I am and all that I have to you. This is what Mary is articulating to us in her response to Jesus in this moment. She's saying, everybody, 2,000 years later, I don't think she, she didn't recognize that this was what she was doing, but this is what the Lord is teaching us in this text, that he is so worthy of us opening our hands completely to him, saying, I surrender all to you. He is so much more amazing than my current view, than your current view, than our current view, view of him. He is so amazing that it caused Mary to completely open up her hands to say, I surrender everything to you. May we know Jesus like Mary knew Jesus. May we know Jesus and know his love, know his power, know his glory, know his magnificence at such an incredible level that it would call, cause every one of us in here to say, man, I surrender everything to you because you are worthy of that sacrifice. You are worthy of that surrender. Man, I want to pray for that for us, for our church. And so let's pray. Jesus, I, I, I ask first, first and foremost that you would forgive me as the under-shepherd of this church, that you would forgive us for not treasuring you at the level that you are worthy to be treasured. That sometimes, sometimes, we, you know, we may not have hearts to the extent of Judas, but sometimes we do act like Judas. Sometimes we clench our fists to other treasures that are nowhere in comparison to you. Would you forgive us of that? Would you forgive us of not treasuring as we should? And would you open our hearts and open our minds and open our hands, pry them open if you have to, to be able to treasure you like Mary did? Would you open up our minds, open up our hearts, Open up our hands to treasure you so much, to see your beauty, to see your love, to see your, your great display that was poured out, your great love that was displayed and poured out for us on the cross. And may that move us to the point to where we say, Jesus, I surrender it all to you. I surrender my health to you. I surrender my, my wealth to you. I surrender all the earthly treasures that I'm seeking and pursuing for you. Jesus, would you help our level of surrender to match the treasure that you are worthy, that you are so worthy of? Would you help us to pray? Would you help us to sing and declare in this very moment, at this very hour, our petition before you? We're gonna, pr we're gonna sing it in song, Lord. Would you help us to sing it like we mean it? Offering our hearts, offering our minds, offering our hands, our some surrendered hands to you. Jesus, we love you. You're so worthy of praise. Help to increase our hearts towards you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and Let's worship. Stand. Thank you.
this morning with a, just a time of offering. We always kind of close out our services in this way, just a chance for us to respond. If perfectly uh, after just talking today about what is our treasure. And so it's just a great time for us to reflect on. Even if you're in the habit, if you're in the routine of giving on a weekly or monthly basis, it's still good for us to stop and ask, am I just doing this out of a routine? Am I even thinking about what I'm doing or is it because I'm treasuring Christ above all? And so we have a code here at City Awakening where we say we want to live contently, give generously to reach more missionally. And so I just want to encourage you to think about that today. Are you living contently? What steps do you need to take to put Christ above everything else so that you're content with, with your situation? Paul said he's found the, the, the secret to being content in whatever life brings him, whether good or bad, is to know that he can do all things through Christ who strengthens him. And he's content in the ability that he has through Christ alone. And so that would be our prayer for you today, for us as a church family. And whenever you're ta- ready to take that step in giving with us today, we uh, would be honored for you to do that. If you're here physically in the building, we have a basket in the back. We're not going to pass it there around, but you can place your offering envelope in the basket on your way out. And of course, if you're online, uh, then the link is going to appear there uh, in the chat box, and you can give online as well. And if you want to mail uh, in a check, if you're uh, going to take that route, then you can certainly do that as well. Uh, and so we'd be honored for you to partner with us in giving and fulfilling the ministry that we have here in Orlando. 
And then also, we want to continue to encourage you to get plugged in to one of our small groups. Right now, especially, it's easy for us to be isolated and just kind of not uh, connected to people as we're at home, uh, not in our regular routine. So find a way to get connected to one of our small groups. Those are meeting uh, online still, and some are starting to meet back in person uh, in homes. And so we'd be honored uh, to help you find a group you have a connect card in your group of chairs this morning. And so if there's any way we can help you take a next step with us as a church, whether that's finding a small group, learning about membership, baptism, a way to serve, any of those things, you can just drop that in the offering basket as well. And of course, if you're online, then you can just contact us through the link there in the chat box. And then lastly, we just want to recognize fathers again today. Uh, we have a special gift for fathers. And so dads, if you didn't get a chance when you came in, there's a table over here on the side where you can just put your name and email. Uh, and then we have a $10 gift card we're going to be sending you over uh, in the next day. Uh, in the next 24 hours, you should show, uh, get that link in your email. If you're online, you can follow the link there as well, and we'll send that to you. And just as a way of us honoring you, uh, we recognize the, the role and responsibility to be a biblical father is great, uh, and uh, we don't want to take that lightly. Uh, and so just know that as Emmanuel prayed earlier, we're praying God's blessing on you. He will strengthen you in that role uh, and continue just to lead and guide you with wisdom uh, for your family. And so um, we're honored to partner with you and link arms with you in that role. And if there's anything that we can do to support you in that, please let us know that as well as a church. Uh, we want to honor the role of fathers and, and help that. So thank you so much for being here this morning, whether in person or online. We look forward to seeing you back next week. We'll continue to do this. Make your RSVP if you're going to be here in person. If you're online, then we'll see you there. Uh, and as always, we want to send you out to carry the message of Christ with you wherever you go this week. So City Awakening, you're sent.